One important thing to know about Detroit during the past 100 years is that it is a boom and bust city and economy. The morale of the people swing from high to low and unfortunate times are unprecedented. Where you want to go, the Model T. Strong, sturdy, with a will of its own. The financial house of cards collapses and the overinflated stock market plunges into a Great Depression. A financial panic grips the world. After each bust Detroit faces, there's always hope to rise above it. After Detroit hit rock bottom in the Great Depression, Detroit was saved from its role in the arsenal of democracy. I want to make it clear that it is the purpose of the nation to build now with all possible speed every machine, every arsenal, every factory that we need to manufacture our defense material. But unfortunately, once again, every boom has its bust. In a hundred places, Detroit is afire. The destroyers striking from as far as three miles away. In the state of Michigan, I do hereby officially request the immediate deployment of federal troops into Michigan. Many people may say this is the lowest point in Detroit's history. The Motor City is now the broke city. Detroit has filed for bankruptcy. Michigan's funding of education in 2015 was only 82% of what it was back in 1995. It's staggering. Over a million people have left the Motor City. For the past year, 3,100 more people have made the decision to leave Detroit. The coronavirus pandemic has tanked the global economy with unprecedented speed. When Henry Ford and the other automakers really got going in the 1920s, that's when Detroit had its biggest boom ever, its population explosion to nearly 2 million people ultimately. Um, the boom was big in the 20s. 1929 happened and no city collapsed fast, faster and harder than Detroit. Simply because people were laid off, they couldn't buy cars, and the Great Depression hit Detroit like no other city. It was a devastating blow to American morale. This is a country that uh, considered themselves uh, one of the leading economies in the world, one of the highest standards of living in the world. Um, ever since World War I, the United States had been a creditor nation instead of a debtor nation, and now all of that is crushed. Um, it was a devastating blow to families that lost their homes, lost their farms, 25% unemployment. Today, we're experiencing something similar to that with the pandemic. But before that, 4% unemployment was considered an acceptable rate of unemployment. Anything higher than that, a president was likely not to be elected. Um, and at this time, they had 25% unemployment. Also, there weren't any kind of support structures in place yet. Uh, most of these were created during the New Deal after Roosevelt was elected. And I think a glimpse into just how painful this must have been is how many people at first resisted taking any of this uh, relief that was provided by the New Deal because they felt um, proud uh, of them, too proud to take the, uh, the relief and felt ashamed to need the relief or to ask for the relief. When, uh, you know, the winters are pretty brutal in Detroit and um, you know, when you have 50% unemployment suddenly in 1932, there were a lot of people, there were people who starved to death in the city of Detroit in the early 30s. People at all strata were affected. And uh, whether you were unemployed suddenly or, you know, you knew a neighbor who was unemployed. And uh, they say the difference between a recession and a depression, a recession is when your neighbor is unemployed, a depression is when you're unemployed. And that happened to uncounted unprecedented numbers of, of Detroiters during the Great Depression. Now, I think that, again, there are a few reasons why people supported the arsenal of democracy concept. One was they did see the necessity of helping our allies, um, whether they saw it as a security necessity or not, because many people did think, hey, there's the Pacific Ocean between us and Europe. They at least saw that a 
destroyed France, or destroyed Great Britain, that you know that all of our allies destroyed. France is already in the hands of, of the Nazis at that time. That a collapse of Britain doesn't help America. Uh, that they're one of our biggest trading partners. And then again, also providing ships, providing weaponry, providing tanks to our allies meant money at a time when America's economy was in very, very bad shape. No city revived quicker and more fully to the point where there was a shortage of workers. People were working around the clock. Once you begin, you get into 1940 and then after Pearl Harbor, the city went into overdrive. If you're a PVT, your duty is to salute to L-I-E-U-T. But if you brush the L-I-E-U-T, the MP makes you KP on the QT. This is the GI. President Roosevelt called Ford and he sent his representative to Washington and they said, you know, how many we need you. Could you, you think you could build planes on an assembly line like you're doing with the cars? And they said, oh, absolutely. So he said, uh, well, how many can you? He said, well, I don't know. Let me go back and we'll figure it out. You know? So keep in mind, they were building around four a month. So um, he came back to uh, Washington, D.C., and they said, well, well what, do you, you know, what do you think you can do? He said, well, once we get the lines and everything up and running, we think we can build um, uh, eight an hour. Yeah, I said, you know, we need some realistic number here. You know, said, no, that's, that's what we can do. There was this sense we are pulling together for something bigger than each of us. There's a sort of teamwork ethic that doesn't usually, uh, isn't usually so profound. I do think Pearl Harbor woke people up. I give a lot of credit, by the way, to leadership. I think President Roosevelt, uh, people in government, Frank Murphy in Michigan. I think our military leaders on the military. So we, had, we were blessed with an exceptional uh, generation of leaders. And that trickled down to the workers on the line, um, you know, all the way from uh, from Washington to the shop floor in Hamtramck and at the River Rouge plant. So morale was very high, but I think it really is an incredibly uplifting thing to feel that you're part of something big. I think uh, if you look into the history of the disruptions, riots, if you want to call them, were very localized. You know, it's like when you speak of a, a riot, you think of you know riot in Detroit, you think the whole city is. No, that's that wasn't that wasn't the way it was at all. But anyway, in the 40s, my dad was working downtown, and I remember there was that incident on the bridge in Delisle, and it spreads. You know, people are angry and. People started moving out, and uh, you could call it the day of decay of the city. The only thing that was left is people didn't have any any income to support or pay taxes, right, to support the community. So guess what? It got even worse. There was even less things being done, and less roads being fixed, and less homes being knocked down that should have been knocked down, and so on. So it just got worse and worse and worse. And you don't have to go too far out of here to still see, witness what, what that did to the city of Detroit. I think, you know, there was this around the nation, and Detroit certainly led the way, fight to the suburbs, to lower tax base, away from labor unions. Um, there's white flight, you know, uh, cities were emptied out in many cases in Detroit, you know, had this incredible loss of population because of all the problems of congestion and racial conflict and so forth. Unfortunately for Detroit, these interstate highways were rammed through neighborhoods, which make it real easy to get in and out of the city. Uh, the deck was stacked in so many ways for this kind of flight from the city. Uh, if 
you become complacent and you're the only game in town, quality starts hurting you. And that's what happened, I think, in the automobile industry. And uh, I'm not anti-union. There's a time and place for everything. But what happened is that, you know, you can always, you can take a good thing and make it bad if you overuse it. And uh, there was a time when everybody had a job, and that's what you did, you know. And, uh, but then, um, Indra said, well, we, we need you to do this and this. And uh, I don't know if you've ever seen anybody working on a, on a line. Today, you know, we have a lot of automation, so it's replaced a lot of the heavy industrial stuff. The pandemic has added terrible effect on Detroit's economy. And it's largely because we've had to shut down so many businesses during this time. Um, and again, you have that problem of demand and that I've just described before that if you've got, and also the, the, the problem of supply. So you've got a lot of businesses that can't be open. The problem we have today is so many people uh, work in the service industry which involves a lot of interaction with people. I think of all the restaurants, for instance, restaurant workers, retail. Um, I, read a, I read an item in the financial page of the New York Times today that 35, 40% of the jobs that have been lost are never coming back, at least in the same form they were. So Detroit already had a, not much of, the city of Detroit doesn't have much margin for error because you have so many people living on the edge, living paycheck to paycheck. Well, I'm a, a proud resident of Detroit, 47 years. Uh, as you know, in the world know that things is kind of screwed up since this the Corona-19. Uh, I was a cook for like 25 years. I worked at Calexico, I worked at Firebird, I worked at Nicky's. All those restaurants, I started from the bottom and worked my way up to the top. So it wasn't nothing given to me. I always had to work hard, even when I was little. So I say all that to say this, that uh, the economy, everybody is suffering. Some is worse than others. Some, some people's situation is uh, bad off than others are. But at the end of the day, we all are suffering. I'm just looking for uh, better days to come uh, to get my job back uh, more than anything. So, how will Detroit's economy persevere? This question is left up to the people in its upcoming generations. Together, we need to diversify Detroit in its economy. The automobile industry can no longer save us, and it's the new ideas and businesses of the people that can pull us out of this long-lasting decline. From our ancestors in the arsenal of democracy, we must learn that this problem isn't fought alone. With the collaboration of the city and the people's ideas, we must continue to make Detroit a more diverse and welcoming place for the future. I just want people to just take away from this that we all the same, even though we may come from different backgrounds and things like that. But we all have the same mission in life, and that's to, to stay above water and, and to try to get ahead. And with that, um, blessings and uh, have a great day. <laughs>